You saw in the previous section that atoms can combine chemically through bonds to form molecules. If the same atom is bonded to itself repeatedly, we get an element. And if different atoms bond to one another, we can get compounds. Each of the three that you see here are different compounds. We have water, ammonia, and carbon dioxide. By the end of this section, you should be able to describe how shape affects the properties of molecules and some of the unusual properties that water has that makes it essential for life. A molecule's shape is going to give it unique characteristics, such as the physical properties of taste and smell. In this highly stylized diagram of a tongue here, you see that the tongue has different receptors. Each one is attuned and prepared to receive information about a particular taste. So we recognize the pentagonal shape of the pentose sugar fructose as being sweet and the hexose sugar glucose as being even more sweet. We recognize the cubic nature of salt as being, well, salty. Of course, it's not only with taste, but with smell as well. Whether we're aware of it or not, there are pheromones that affect humans um, and certainly other animals res respond very strongly to pheromones as well. So with the male gypsy moths, and you can see that this male gypsy moth over here is picking up a pheromone in the air that's sent by this female. Oh, sorry, this is the female sending it off and this is the receptor site on the male picking up that pheromone scent and they can pick this up from as far as two miles away. If you've ever had a female dog go into heat, you know that male dogs from miles away will come because they sense that they smell that pheromone. And humans are affected by this as well. We just don't seem to be quite as aware of the effect that it has on us. Now, water has particular properties related to that polar covalent bond and those hydrogen bonds that exist between them. One of these properties is its high surface tension. It will allow animals such as the Jesus lizard here to run across the water. It will also enable insects to float along the top. They just kind of stand and walk across the top. Uh, it allows some of the increased buoyancy. It's what enables leaves to stay at the top of the water. And it's one of the things that we use uh, within the sciences when we're looking at a side of a graduated cylinder. We, it's what forms that meniscus, that curved top to the water. Cohesion tension is another one. This is also because due to the polar covalent nature of water and those hydrogen bonds that exist between each water molecule. This is what enables plants to transport sugars and water throughout their body. They don't have a heart to pump, and yet they're able to move liquids down from the roots of a tree all the way up to the leaves. They're able to take the sugars that were made in the leaves and bring it down to the roots for storage and take water and stored sugars up towards the leaves for uh, regrowth and purposes in the spring of bringing those leaves back. And this is going to happen because of the process of transpiration or evaporation out of the leaves. As one water molecule evaporates out of the leaf, since it is connected through this cohesion, almost like Velcro to the next water molecule, as it leaves, it pulls the next water molecule up, which pulls the one behind it, which pulls the one behind that, sort of like pulling a string of paper clips right up directly down from the roots. All of this because of those hydrogen bonds. Water also has a large heat capacity or a high specific heat, and that's what enables it to maintain its temperature for such a long period of time. You need to add a significant amount of energy to change the temperature of water. It's sort of that idea of the watched pot never boils. It takes water a really long time to heat up, even though the pot that it's in heats up almost immediately, right? A minute or so after you turn the water on to boil, you can still put your finger in the water, but you wouldn't want to touch the pot that the water was riding in. And that's the same thing with water and nature. 
it takes a really long time for it to heat up in the summer and it takes a very long time for it to cool down and freeze in the winter because of this large heat capacity. It's also a low density as a solid, right? We all know that ice, if you plop it down into a drink, is going to float. Well, this happens to be a very useful property if you're an aquatic animal and you're living in the water, right? Once a pond or a river begin, or a lake begins to freeze, imagine what would happen to all the aquatic life if ice, like many other solids, was more dense than its liquid form. Right? It would sink down to the bottom and it would kill and stagnate anything that was living in there. But because it's a lower density as a solid, it floats and that allows all the aquatic life to stay healthy and alive during the winter as long as the whole pond doesn't freeze up solid. And water is also a good solvent. It's sometimes referred to as the universal solvent. So we can see here in the glass, we put some salt down into the bottom if we look at the blow up, we see the salt crystals, the sodium and chloride, still bonded to one another. But as they remain in the water, they'll dissociate and dissolve, and we get individual sodium ions surrounded by water and individual chlorine ions also surrounded by water. And that dissolution is inherent to nearly everything on the planet. Most things will dissolve in water again because of that polar covalent nature. So think about these four questions, pause the video and take a moment to answer them and restart it once you're done. So I hope you've had a chance to think about these four and as you look at the answers here feel free to pause it if you need and again Feel free, as always, to email or send a message through Sally if you have any questions.